this issue of the carnal Christian does not exist in the Bible. It's never a, the issue of having this third category isn't in the Bible at all. And basically, the way Dr. Sproul addressed this issue is he addressed it historically. So he looked at two historical types of carnal Christians. He looked at the antinomianists, which Kurt went over with me on how to pronounce because I kind of slur it. Um, it's antinomianist. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And then the other one is the perfectionist. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the antinomianist because the antinomianist, basically, if you know its component parts, it's anti and nomos, or anti-law. It's somebody that completely believes in the grace of God to the point where they think that they can do whatever they want. You're in God's graces, so let's just live it up and do whatever we please. So Dr. Sproul, he looked at, in his book, he looked at the chapter in Romans to confront this issue, and we're going to turn to the same area of the Bible. We're going to turn to Romans, but we're not going to look at chapter 7. We're going to look at chapter 6. So if you want to turn there, we're going to look at chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, 1 through 11. And I'm just going to give you a quick fast forward through the book of Romans, just to, as review. So Romans 1 through 3, we basically see that all are sinners. According to Romans 3.23, we see that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That basically summarizes Romans 1 through 3. Okay, you never have to read that again. So now, moving on. Romans 4 through 5. Romans 4 through 5 talks about justification. We see that Jesus Christ basically paid the price for sin, and it's an act of grace that he pays the price for sin. And Romans 5.8 says, And while we were yet... Oh, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we see that... Jesus basically paid the price for sin, and it's an act of grace that God does, and that's justification. But in Romans 6 through 8, he, he shifts into the Christian life of sanctification, of becoming holy, of becoming a person who lives like Jesus Christ. And so Romans 6, 1 through 11, deals with this issue of the carnal Christian, this person who thinks that they can basically live in grace, but then at the same time, in this grace doesn't call them to do anything. It just calls them to sit there and basically just sin. And so we're going to look at this passage. I hope it does two things. I hope it discourages the carnal Christian, but I hope it encourages the true Christians in this room. Because we all have struggles with sin, we all confront sin, and this passage has some essential knowledge that we need to know. Once we come to a relationship with Christ, there are things that change in our life and in our relationship to sin, and this passage tells us these things. And so I appropriately addressed this or titled this message according to the carnal Christian, so don't be offended. I titled it, Stop Being an Idiot, because that's pretty much what Paul's going to say. He's going to say, stop being a big idiot. That's what he's going to say in Romans 6, 1 through 11. So let's read the passage of Romans 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that As Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in his likeness, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who is died... He who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Sorry, I'm, I lean forward now because I spend so much time in the books. I'm, I'm like, I have some serious problem with my eyes. I can't like see up close anymore, and I can't see far away. It's, I don't know. 
it's a good reasoning for why you should not study too hard. So we're going to begin in verse 1. It says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Paul has just gotten through in Romans 4 and 5 talking about the free gift of grace that God gave. And so naturally some people are thinking, well, if it's all by grace and I can't do anything to gain my salvation, then obviously I can do whatever I want. And so some people earnestly were thinking this issue and Paul wanted to address this. But for the most part, most people just want to take advantage of God's grace. And so he's also addressing these people who want to take advantage of God's grace. And there have been many deceivers in the past who have taught this, that since God's grace is with you, well, then just do whatever you want. Live it up. In fact, one Russian monk said, the more a person sins, the more grace he will receive. So sin with gusto. Well then, there, and this is just a common trend that has gone out through, throughout history. And basically what we're seeing now today is the carnal Christian is basically this doctrine just wrapped up in a new, in a new shell called carnal Christianity instead of antinomianism. And so what does Paul say? He says, may it never be. But there's an important distinction I want to make just starting out in the point of this, in this message is that it says, are we to continue in sin? It doesn't say, are we to sin so that grace may abound? So we're not talking about the issue of whether a Christian sins and doesn't sin. We all know that we sin. Obviously, if I asked you to raise your hands, everybody should raise their hands and say, well, yeah, I've sinned before as a Christian. That's not the issue Paul's addressing here. He's addressing the issue of continually, blatantly, intentionally living in sin. He's going to address that issue specifically. And what does he say? He says, by no means can any Christian, true, genuine Christian, live in this state. And that's the whole point of the, the, the whole point of this passage is just, that's it. He says, by no means. That's it. That's, that's the bottom line of the passage. Everything we're going to look at are going to be proofs of why this is so. So if you were to walk out of here tonight, you'd have the main point. It's, can, a, can a Christian continue in sin? No. Okay, well, you're done. Go be blessed and have a nice night. But Paul goes on, and what he does is, is in 2 through 10, he gives four proofs of why a Christian cannot continue in sin. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at four proofs of why Christians cannot continue in sin. And there's one little caveat I want to give to you before I I go through this, is that in this passage, Paul is intertwining a whole bunch of themes and ideas, and it's not very clear cut. It's not one verse after another. It's a bunch of themes that have been intertwined, and Paul is just giving an amorphous blob of themes. And so I'm trying to pull out these main four themes that are from this text. And so sometimes we may jump around and stuff, but hopefully you will bear with me. And the first point we're going to look at is actually in verses 3 through 5. Verses 3 through 5 is the crux of this passage. This is the core of this whole section in verses 3 through 5. If you notice in verse 3, it says, We have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Have been baptized into Christ Jesus. If you look in verse 4, it says, We were buried together with Him. In verse 5, if you keep going, you see that we were united with him. If you're beginning to sense a trend, huh? Okay, good. Um, it says we were united together with him. And this word united in verse 5 is actually a, a botanical term. It's, I, yeah, I didn't know what that meant until I looked it up. But it's basically um, these two trees or these plants are being bound together. And they're being grafted together. Like, have you seen those pear trees where, like, you have this tree and it has, like, Peruvian pears and Japanese pears and there's all these pears on it and it's basically just all these branches grafted onto this one tree? Well, that's what this term means, united. It means implanted or grown together. And so it's talking about your unity or your being grown together in Christ. This, this idea continues in verse 6. It says, we were crucified together with him. And then if you continue on in verse 8, it says, we died with him. And then in verse 8, it also says, we shall live together with him. Again, 
And so what we're seeing is this trend of being with Christ or being united with Christ. And that's the first proof that Paul's trying to give in this text is that believers are united with Christ. That's the first proof he gives why believers cannot continue in sin is that believers are united with Christ. That's the first point. And you're probably wondering, well, how close? Well, one theologian stated, when we put our faith in Christ, we are united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. We are united with Christ in all that he means. Another theologian stated, the union is of the closest sort, and life from Christ flows through to the believer. And so this is a union that is close and tight and intimate. Intimate. We also notice that within these verses 3 through 5 that Paul is talking about, he's giving a picture of baptism. If you notice, he mentions baptism a couple times in verse 3. It says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism. So we're also seeing this picture of baptism, which strengthens this idea of your union with Christ. And this would have been quite clear to a Roman Christian, because to a Roman Christian, being baptized and conversion were pretty much the same thing. In the first century, baptism was an initiatory rite into the church. So if you believed in Christ and had this faith in Christ, what was the appropriate thing you would do? You would get baptized. You would profess it to all the church and tell all the people, I believe in Christ, I have this change in my life, and I want to tell you all through the act of baptism that I believe this too. As well in the first century and as well in in the Bible, faith and baptism were sometimes interlinked. If, um, don't flip there, but in Acts 2.38, if you want to look it up later, or maybe you want to look at it now, it says, repent and be baptized. It, it links these two ideas together. See, baptism and faith aren't two distinct ideas. They're basically connected in one whole. And I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you need baptism to be saved because you don't need baptism to be saved, but it was so in their minds that if there was an inward change in their hearts, they wanted to express that some way. And the way the Bible gave to express that change in your life and in your heart was to express that through baptism so that people would understand and know that this change had occurred in your life. F.F. F. Bruce says about baptism, he says, they were in fact buried with Christ when they were dipped in the baptismal water in token that they had died so far as their old life of sin was concerned. They were raised with Christ when they emerged from the water in token that they had received a new life, which is nothing less than participation in Christ's own resurrection life. And so you see this union with Christ that's symbolized in baptism. We're baptized into his death, which shows our death to this old way of life. And we're we're also seeing, we're also in in the act of baptism. We also see the act of coming out of the water and raising to new life. And so, in the act of baptism and in this picture of baptism Paul is presenting in verses 3 and 4, we see that this unity, we have this unity with Christ. This is this idea of union with Christ permeates the Gospels and also um, the epistles. And one of Paul's writings that really brings this out is Galatians. I want to, if you want to flip to Galatians 2.20, this idea of your union with Christ is really brought forth. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So on a basic level, how can we answer this question of why a Christian can't continue in sin? Because you're united with Christ. And, and this is a very obvious thing that you should all know, basically. And Paul wasn't trying to make this anything deep or theologically deep because everybody was baptized. They all knew that they were united with Christ. He's just reminding them of what they should have already known, that you're united with Christ. And if you're united with Christ and Christ is with you all the time, how can you continually live in sin? It doesn't make any sense. In fact, some commentators would say that it's just basically idiotic to live in sin. How can you live in sin? You're, you're united with Christ. You're united with your Savior. How can you continue in sin in the midst of that? But the one thing I do want to point out about this issue of, of being united with Christ and Christ being with us and this being a reason for us 
um, in the process of, of growing in God and becoming holier. It's only appropriate that this should be so because how were we saved? We were saved when we were united with Christ, right? We need to be united with Christ in order to be saved from our sin. Well, in the same way, how do we get sanctified? How do we grow holier? Well, we need to be united with Christ and we need to trust in that union with Christ that we have. I think sometimes as believers, what we do is we trust in Christ to be saved, but then we trust in ourselves to get holy. And what Paul's bringing forward here is you can't trust in yourself to be holy or to get yourself through and become a better, um, become more Christ-like. So you need to think about that. Are, are you trusting in yourself to be sanctified? You're trusting in Christ as your Savior to to basically save you from your sin and bring you to heaven, but then are you trusting in yourself to bring yourself to become more holy and more Christ-like? So that's something to think about. But this union with Christ is basically going to like intertwine and interflow with every other, other proof we're going to address tonight. The second proof is believers are dead to sin. Believers are dead to sin. And if you want to look at verse 6, verse 6 Romans 6, 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. So our old self is destroyed. Or, But I want to look at another passage to kind of tease this idea out of what it means for our old self to be destroyed. So if you want to flip to Galatians 5, 24, this really brings out what old self being destroyed means. What does that mean? Galatians 5.24. It says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So your old self with its passions and desires are now dead. If you're united with Christ, your old self and its passions and desires are dead. It's also reminiscent of 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. It says the old self is done with, passed away, deceased. It's over with. And for what purpose? It says that our body of sin might be done away with. Our body, our body that belonged to sin, our body that sin made its home in, is now, the the Greek word's katar geto, and and it's translated done away with or annihilated in the New King James, but it's not literally like our bodies are annihilated because we know that's not so because it's right here, like right here. Here. So, annihilated isn't exactly a good term either. In the Greek, it literally means rendered inoperative. So, your body of sin is now inoperative. It doesn't work. It's broken down. So, basically, we see that the old self with its passions and, and desires are destroyed. We also see that our body of sin is rendered inoperative, out of order, out of commission, And basically, that's why we see in verse 2, if you want to just look, glance back at verse 2, it says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? That's why he can ask that rhetorical question and assume one truth, that basically believers are of the nature of being dead to sin. And so we see that we are dead to sin. When did we die? Die to sin? That's also found in verse 2. The word, it says, died well, it, when I was reading in English, it doesn't really mean that much. And you're kind of like, well, died. That's great. And then you read all this Greek junk and you're like, whoa, I didn't know that one word could mean that much stuff. Um, it's not talking about like a continually dying day to day. It's not talking about a future dying. It's talking about a decisive moment, a, a pinnacle point where basically you died to sin. What is that moment where you died to sin? When is that? The moment you're united with Christ. The moment you're united with Christ, you're dead to sin. So that's basically what Paul is saying there in that theme. But there's another closely tied theme to being dead to sin that we're also going to look at. And that's found in verse 6 as well. 
if I just didn't read the rest of the verse in verse 6, the back half, it says, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. The result of being dead to sin is that we're no longer slaves to sin. And that's the third point. Believers are no longer a slave to sin. That's We're going to look at that in verse 6 and verse 7. Believers are no longer a slave to sin. Sin is basically pictured as the subject in this sentence, that sin is basically the, in control. It, he's the one who's your master, and he basically dominates your life. When you're an unbeliever, sin dominates your life. Even in your best of intentions of, of maybe giving to the poor or whatnot, all these things are built on selfish motives, and so God considers this all sin. And so you are basically driven by Sin, your master is sin when you are an unbeliever. Our pastor, John MacArthur, says, the Christian is no longer under the compulsion and tyranny of sin, nor will he dutifully and solely obey sin as he formerly did. That's what he thinks. That's what he says, being, no longer being a slave to sin is. And this is a wonderful truth because when we are an unbeliever, All we could do is sin. We only had one option. Our only single option was sin. And once Jesus Christ came into our lives and we were baptized into his death and we died to sin and we were no longer a slave to sin, what happened? Well, now we're a slave to God. We have an opportunity to serve God. And instead of sinning all the time, we have an opportunity to serve God. And though though as basic as that seems, That's a powerful truth that we should understand and know when we face sin every day. That we're no longer slaves to sin. That we are under God's kind and caring control. And and we have a master who's great and cares for us. And we can serve him instead of serving sin. And so that is just a powerful and great truth. But why why are we no longer a slave to sin? Why, Why is this so? Why is this truth here? Well, verse 7 explains why this is so. Verse 7 says, For he who has died is freed from sin. Freed means acquitted or justified. For he who has died is freed from sin. According to Romans 6.23, it says, "For, For the wages of sin is death, or the penalty of sin is death. So, basically, you need to die to pay the penalty for sin. Well, when we were baptized in the Christ, well, now we paid that price of death through Christ. And so since we paid that death of uh, that death to, or that penalty of sin in Christ, now we are free and no longer slaves of sin because we're not indebted to the master any longer. We're not indebted to the master of sin because we've already paid up all our debts, which was death. And so that is paid And so we see that we've seen so far that basically we're united with Christ. We're dead to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. And just based on that, why would any Christian want to continue to live in sin? Just based on those three truths, why would you want to continue to live in sin? And we're seeing this progression, basically. We're seeing a progression that runs from being united with Christ to dying with Christ to no longer being a slave to sin. And you can probably see where this is going because we're die, 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 die. So where else is there to go but to live? And so we're going to look at this fourth issue, this fourth proof, which is basically believers are raised to new life. This is the fourth issue we're going to look at. Believers are raised to new life. And we're going to have to jump back and look back at verses 4 and 5, which pick up this idea of being raised to new life. If you look in verse 4, it says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Death has a purpose. Death has a purpose. Death... The purpose of death is basically to be raised to new life. And that's what God tells us there. But what does walking in newness of life look like? What does that look like? Because I was reading that. I was like, walk in newness of life. That's good, but what does that mean? And so we're going to look at a couple different things of what that means to walk in newness of life. 
The first thing that looks like is letter A is uh, we are alive to God. That's the first thing it is. We are alive to God. Before we were dead in sin and now we're dead to sin. And as well, before we were dead to God, but now we are alive to God. And we see that being alive to God, our hearts are changed. That now we have desires to please God. That we have thoughts of God. That the Bible pops in our brains at times. Like times we don't think it should pop in there, but it pops in there and it helps us. And, and there's this change in our hearts, in our inner selves that looks to God. This is the first part of this newness of life. It's seen in Colossians 2.13. It says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. So we're, we're alive with, with Christ and we're alive to God and our hearts are attuned to God now. And we look to God. And so that's the first part of this newness of life. B, this is where it gets interesting. We have the resurrection power of God. And this is actually seen in Paul's argument in Romans 6, verse 5. It says, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So the likeness of his death. Basically, it's not that we literally died. We're not dead yet. But we experience the power of being dead to sin, correct? But then also we see that we're we're also in the likeness of his resurrection. Are we literally resurrected? No, not yet. What is that talking about? It's talking about the benefit of being, having his resurrection power. That's how we're in the likeness of his resurrection is we have his resurrection power right now. In, in the Greek, in this, I hate to keep going back to the Greek, but it, it helps. So it says, we shall also be like him or be in the likeness of the resurrection. It says, we shall also be. This word to be is in the future tense. It basically looks to the future, but then it points out or emphasizes the present effects of looking to the future. We're looking to the future at the resurrection, but then there's present effects in our lives right now. And that present effect that Paul's trying to draw forward is the fact that we have resurrection life, resurrection power right now, today. And we can see that idea in Philippians 3.10. If you would like to go there. Philippians 3.10. In Philippians 3.10 and 11, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And so he, you see both aspects of him wanting to understand the resurrection power that's basically within him. And at the same time, he looks forward to the resurrection. And that's exactly what Paul's trying to do in verse 5, is he's looking forward to the resurrection of attaining this resurrection, but at the same time, we have this resurrection power in us. And that's how we live in the likeness of his resurrection today. This is extremely poignant because how can a Christian who has the resurrection power of God, who has the power that basically resurrected Christ from the dead, why would you want to live in sin? Why would you want to continue in sin if you have the very power of God to overcome sin? It doesn't make any sense. I think you'll see the the absurdity grows because, see, this this newness of life, also we are living with Christ. This is a point that we have addressed before, but it's also addressed again in verse 8 of Romans. Romans 6, verse 8. It says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Christ with him. So you you died to Christ. I mean, you died with Christ (laughs) and now you're also living with him right now. So the passage is basically in verse eight is talking about right now. It's not talking about a future, a future living with him or seeing him. It's actually talking about right now you're living with Christ. Christ is in your life right now. It's talking about that Paul's just re-emphasizing your union with Christ is so intimate that you're living with him 
He's in house in you right now and he's living with you. And so not only do you have resurrection power to fight against sin, but now he's also living in you. Jesus is living in you. And obviously that's kind of like, well, duh, like, okay, like a fifth grader would understand that, like, Jesus in my heart. Like, of course, Adam, come on. But Paul is using this argument because it's so basic, but it's so poignant. If you're a Christian and you say you believe in God and, and that you truly believe and want to follow him, and then you continually live in sin, you're denying something so basic. Jesus is in you. Jesus is standing right be- beside you every time you go, anywhere you go, and every time you sin, he sees it. So why would you want to continue in sin? But it continues. Another thing, that this newness of life. What does this newness of life entail besides we are living with Christ and then we back up and we also see the resurrection power of God and also that we are alive to God? Well, D, it also entails we are not afraid of death. We are not afraid of death. That's in verse 9. It says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. And so, Christ overcame death. But what does that mean for us? Well, since we're united with Christ and he overcame death, so we too overcome death. And this is really probably, I think this is the biggest slap in the face to somebody who thinks that they could live in continual sin, is Christ gives you this free gift of paying the price for your sins, and then you would just basically take advantage of that and say, that's great. That's great that Jesus paid the price for my sins and that he paid the penalty of death for me. That's great. But I'm going to continue to live in sin. How could, it's like unfathomable. How could you look in the face of God and tell him, well, that's great. Thanks for the free gift. And now I'm going to continue on my way in sin. That's unbelievable. So we see that this new life, God just richly blesses us with all these these blessings of newness of life. and, And basically the carnal Christian it's basically an oxymoron at this point because a true Christian with all these benefits, how can you be carnal and have and be a Christian who has all these benefits? It's, it's unbelievable. In fact, one theologian stated about this newness of life. He said, those raised from the dead through faith in Christ, they enter into an entirely new sphere of existence. The lives of believers are to be as different from their pre-conversion days as life is from death. And so our, we come back to our four proofs. We are united with Christ. We are dead to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. And we are raised to walk in newness of life. But how can we have confidence in these proofs or truths that Paul is giving us of why we can't continue in sin? That's in verse 10. Verse 10 says, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Jesus died on the cross and now he's resurrected. That's the proof. We have a living Savior who reigns in heaven. That's the proof of why we can be so confident in these claims and these proofs, these reasons that Paul is giving why a Christian cannot live in continual sin. I hope you can see now that basically a carnal Christian, based on that argument that Paul just presented to us, where does the carnal Christian stand? He has no argument. What can he say? He really can say nothing at all. Our union in Christ basically takes care of sin and then gives us all these great benefits to overcome and live this victorious life. And what can a carnal Christian say? But there is one question that's left, and you may be thinking this in the back of your minds, is if we have all this, then why do we still sin? Verse 
Because it seems like, well, if you're dead to sin and you're no longer slave to sin and you have this resurrection power and you're living with Jesus and he's in your life, then why do we still sin at all? And the secret to that is in verse 2. If you want to look at Romans 6, verse 2, it says, How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Who died? We did. We died to sin. Sin's not dead. Sin's still alive. The presence of sin is everywhere. It's still in the world, and it's still on us in our weak flesh, in our flesh that has uh, evil and sinful tendencies and habits locked within it. Sin's presence is still here. Even though we're freed from the domination of sin, from the tyranny of sin, from this master of sin, sin's still present in the world. That's why we still sin. I think a picture of this that really helped me to clear up these ideas is actually, this is for you, Chuck. Martin Lloyd-Jones has this great picture of, of what this looks like. Basically, there's two fields. And there's the field of Satan and sin, and there's the field of God. And all of us are born into the field of Satan and sin. And we labor, and our master is Satan. And he controls us and we live in continual sin. But then in God's field, God basically buys us, purchases us with his own blood through the blood of his son and takes us from the field of Satan and puts us in the field of God. And now we're in the field of God and we're serving God. And and so we should have no problems. However, the fields are right next to each other. And every once in a while, Satan can say, hi, come back. And and you're on the field and you're on the field of God and and you can work and look to God or you can still look over to Satan. You're, you're not under his control anymore, but you can still be distracted by Satan and go, oh, what? You know, and sort of get drawn in. So he can still he can still go, woo, come over here, but he doesn't have control over you. God has control over you. You're a slave to God, you're in God's field, but you can still be distracted by Satan and his field. And so how do we live basically in this world that is full of sin, but we're free from sin? How do we do that? How do we live? What's the perspective that we should have? That's in verse 11. Verse 11 gives us the perspective of how we should live in the midst of this world that has sin, but we're free from sin. Look at verse 11. It says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. It says, consider yourselves dead to sin. It basically means reason within yourself to live these truths. Basically, you're going to believe these truths so much that you're going to just basically live life in this reality. So I'll give you two things that you can do to basically live out this reality. You know that the old man is dead. The old self is dead. It's crucified. All his passions are dead. Now all you have to do is live like it. That's basically what Paul is saying. These truths are in the Bible. God told me them, and they are true. Now, just live like it. Ephesians 4.22 says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Also, Colossians 3.9. Sorry, I'm going a little fast here. It says, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self, with its evil practices. Basically, you need to make changes to make no recognition of sin. I couldn't really think of an example. The only example I could think of of like giving no recognition to something like it doesn't exist is like, uh, okay, is it, basically like, you know, you're in high school and there's like the girl you like and basically, you know, you're like, ah, you're like ah, you know, and, and she's basically, ah, whatever, you know, just walks away and pretends like you're dead, like you're not even there. That's pretty much what you're supposed to do with sin. Basically, you're just like, sin's like, hey, hey, look at me, I'm a, yeah. And you're supposed to go, oh yeah, whatever. And you're supposed to live like it's not even there because it, it shouldn't even phase you. It's like, oh, sin, that don't phase me. Like, there's no problem. I mean, it's not even there. I mean, I'm dead to it and I'm no longer a slave to it, so I'm just gonna, you know, whatever. So you basically just need to make changes in your life that basically... Just push sin out of the way. 
Like you don't give any opportunity to sin. You just push those things out and you just don't even live in those things any longer. That's basically what Paul's saying when it says, consider yourselves dead to sin. It's, you're just living out this reality. The other half, it is, other half is that the new man is alive to God. You're alive to God. So, well, if you're alive to God, what do you do? Well, you live like you're alive to God. You do the things God wants. And I know that seems kind of like basic and trite and yeah, you're like, great. Sometimes what happens is people, when they confront sin as, as Christians, we confront sin and, and, you know, we go, okay, whatever sin, and we walk the other way. But then when it comes to being alive to God, we don't respond in that way. Like we only do half the picture. We just, we just throw off sin and, oh, okay, whatever. But then we don't do anything beyond that. We don't live like we're living to God. The other half of Colossians 3, 9 is verse 10. It says, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So you put on the new self. You do the things of God. You, you fellowship with believers. You get in the word. You spend time serving him. You exert effort to live for God. Instead of all those efforts that you exerted to live in sin, now you just take all that energy that you wasted on sin and you exert all that energy on God. And that's basically what Paul wants us to do in considering ourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So I hope that helped a little bit, hopefully, on how we can basically not only have these proofs and when we're confronting people who want to live as carnal christians we can use these proofs against them and show them why a christian can't live in sin and as well as encourage you to live the christian life and be victorious in your in your struggles and battles with sin that we have all that we need god has provided us so many benefits and and graces and so we're thankful to him so let's pray god we just thank you for Romans 6, that helps us, that just gives us knowledge, that you, you tell us so much about our relationship with you. You would just expand our knowledge of, of just our union with you and how much you've just provided us with, just the resurrection power and, and just your life living within us and walking with us and, and we're alive to you and we're just so grateful for all these things that you've done and And God, we just pray that we might consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to you. And that we might live victorious Christian lives and overcome struggles of sin. And and as well, Lord, I pray for those who may be the carnal Christian, professing to be a Christian, but continually living in sin and disregard of God and, and his graces. I pray that you might touch their hearts and cause them to test themselves to see if they're truly in the faith that they might truly see you and be saved. And so we thank you for tonight, Lord. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.